some of these, uh, our, our panellists rep, uh, represent organisations that all joined CORE at its um, inception back in 2016. So they have a, a history um, of, of undertaking this work and experience in various ways. So we've got with us Norman Pruter, who's the manager of People and Culture at Pyrenees Shire Council. Kevin O'Brien, the director of Communities and Place at Horsham Rural City and a member of the core leadership group. And Jenny Courtney, who's the director of community engagement at Ballarat Health Services. Um, so I'm going to put two, uh, two or three key questions to the panelists um, to sort of answer in turn. And um, then we'll, we'll go to other questions that um, have uh, appeared in the chat. Um, so I guess, first of all, um, um, Kevin, um, I'm keen to um, ask you why, why did Horsham Rural City join the Core Alliance back in, in 2016? Thanks, Marin. Uh, so Horsham Rural City Council's uh, committed to a safe, uh, equal and respectful society for everyone. So that's, that's what we want to achieve as part of our uh, overall, one of our overall goals for council and uh, our focus around health and well-being. Uh, for us, the some of the statistics for Horsham around uh, uh, domestic violence um, very concerning. Um, so uh, I suppose a bit of an anchor point around the fact of what we want to achieve and where we're at. There was a bit of a it highlights clearly there's a gap in uh, what we need to achieve to um, ensure we've got a uh, safe, equal, and respectful society. So the the core alliance for us was a way to do that uh, through a systematic approach of working in with a range of agencies across the uh, the core region to ensure that we can make some, some key uh, change to enable uh, us to, because uh, it's not just about council in isolation, it's about us working with others. Uh, it's about other agencies, the community, also um, uh, in a collaborative way to achieve that that change that we needed, we need to make and uh, to to go on the journey around uh, uh, addressing the various uh, issues we need to, to bring about that uh, safe, equal and respectful society. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And I will acknowledge that, you know, your role on this journey has been really significant, having come on board when we were actually looking to develop the core plan. So, um, you know, you've contributed um, not just to the, the plan once it was launched, but um, in, in the sort of year or so leading up to um, it actually being realized. So it's it's really has been quite a journey and, and your wisdom um, along that time has been really valued. Um, Jenny, um, I'm interested to hear from you as a, a quite a different organization, Ballarat Health Services, uh, a really large, um, obviously, and significant player um, across the whole cent Central Highlands region. Um, so uh, why, why did you join CORE and um, any reflections on that membership? Sure. Um, we are the largest provider of health services within the region. So we cover from Bacchus Marsh all the way to the South Australian border, um, where we provide services across the full life cycle. So from preconception all the way through to grief and bereavement, there's services that we provide in community, in hospital, in aged care. Um, that means that we have, I guess, experiences with most families across the region. We're the largest employer in town. So we've got four and a half thousand staff and we've got over 260 volunteers as well. So I think for BHS, we really see ourselves as um, quite important in terms of our role we play within community and within families. And that is both as an employer. So the core side of things I think is really, what are we doing as one of the largest employers and a service provider to our community in terms of standing up for equality, but also the fact that our staff is 78% female. So it's really important that um, we are working with that um, data set in mind um, in terms of what our staff might need and also some other aspects of gender and equality in terms of career progression. We are also funded through the state government. Um, we provide, uh, we have a project 
office um, that provides a regional response uh, for strengthening hospitals' response to family violence. So that very much is around training healthcare workers in particular at that front line um, to be able to recognise and act uh, when it comes to people presenting who might be coming um, from incidents of, of family violence. So for us, it's really important on a number of different levels that we have this as part of our um, strategic planning for as an employer, as a service provider, but also as first responders often um, for family violence issues. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'd like to move to you now, Norman, um, and uh, I understand that, you know, you have, have come more recently uh, to uh, participate in this work, uh, at least through CORE, um, uh, in your role at Pyrenees Shire Council. Um, but I'm interested to hear from you what core action um, undertaken by your organisation are you most proud of? And, and I understand that that has had a strong focus in, in the area of HR and recruitment, which is obviously your department. Thanks, Marianne. So um, when I um, took on the role, I have as manager people and culture, Pyrene Shire Council at that stage already um, was a member and signed up to the core program. Um, initially, I sort of tried to keep out of it um, and said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to join in if there are any HR related matters. and. Uh, Quickly, it turned out that there are a lot of um, HR, uh, people in culture matters where I was asked to act or could um, contribute to the to the core. And um, we have done a lot of work. And um, there was a little bit of, um, uh, and Kevin May uh, knows about this, there was also uh, a little bit of overlap at the time when we uh, started with core, that there was funding through the uh, Municipal Association of Victoria, which is the, um, um, the governing body for local government. Uh, who provided funding for the for the listen, learn, and lead program, and we were successful with that funding application. So they were both, both running at the same time, and um, we are small organization, 120 staff members. Um, but it was very interesting. We um, gave staff, we sort of tailored the program internally, and it helped really to raise a better understanding for the senior leadership team. Um, some of the issues are predominantly. Um, obviously female staff are facing when it's about um, career progression, recruitment, going up in a more managerial role or team leader role, et cetera, et cetera. So there was the way I described it in my the previous discussions was there was sort of a process of internal awareness, but at the same time, when I were looking, was looking at our processes, like we changed the, um, the wording in some of our recruitment processes because they were really um, more masculine than feminine. So it was really um, uh, certainly not gender neutral. So what happened is um, I did a bit of research and um, if I'm allowed to extend here a little bit, I do believe that there's a little bit of a disadvantage in the English language, me coming from Germany, where we have a particular way of addressing females it's just in our language. So when we advertised in Germany, we would say manager forward slash minus sign manager in, which is with the ending of IN, you indicate that this is open to a, to a female person. So when I looked at the advertisements we do here, it's all manager, director, coordinator. If I read it, I automatically associate a male person with this position. Um, so and I, 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 I guess and I acknowledge that this is an individual problem for me because it's just because of my cultural background. Having said that, I then did further research and I said, I can't change the English language here, obviously. So what else can I do? So I found a website um, where you can put your advertisement in and by submitting it in the, um, in the same second, you get an answer if you're advertisement is written to a female applicant or to a, um, if the advertisement is written in a masculine language or in a feminine language. And guess what? Most, if not all of our advertisement was written towards a masculine, uh, potentially a masculine applicant. So we have used this tool to change um, the language in our advertisement. Um, we also have, um, I've, in addition, I found then out as part of the research that um, um, and I'm stereotyping here, I guess, but a lot of women would tend 
and in local government it's common that we use key selection criteria as part of the recruitment process. So women would, as part of what I found out as part of the research was that women would only go for a particular job when they would um, um, be able to fulfill all, all of the, for example, six key selection criteria, whereas men, rightly or wrongly, with more confidence, if they cover three, they would cover the three and the other three key selection criteria, they just make up along as they go and they would put in. So that changed the conversation for me here again. So we have changed, um, done a little bit of change in that as well. But then I thought, hmm, if that's the issue here, then how can I assist my internal staff in um, and female staff obviously here to feel more confident to have a crack at a more senior role um, or a promotion. So I used some of the um, savings I had or funding from the Listen, Learn, Lead program and um, run uh, different training. One was a training around recruitment for all staff didn't matter, didn't matter the gender, and that was uh, taken up uh, well. But then I had a dedicated two half day career development uh, training for staff, for female staff, and that was well received. Um, it was really from community care staff. So usually I try to avoid talking in hierarchy here, but it was really from um, the lower rank staff, if I'm allowed to use that terminology, uh, community care staff to really manage uh, and it was, it was fantastic. And the feedback was very positive, not only challenged the, the staff um, to think about their own approach and their own position, but also to um, change their own way of thinking how to approach a potential career development or progression in, in a different direction. So I thought that worked very well and um, the feedback has been very positive. And um, yeah, so we have done a lot of more things, but I don't want to sort of take up all the conversation. So if, I'm happy to extend, but I think that's a, a couple of snapshots what we have done and the feedback has been very positive. And I can say that people where I know um, or people who attended the um, career development staff and um, workshop, that there are a couple of participants who were able to secure team leader or managerial roles, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Norman. That That is really interesting. And, and I think we could probably have a whole conversation about some of the points that you've just touched on for a whole whole webinar. So <laughs> um, that, that may happen down the track. Um, and I think interesting that you touched on, on uh, you know, uh, the mechanisms that you are able to put into action to, to make a difference, but also uh, touched on, you know, issues like unconscious bias that, you know, are very much at play um, and, and uh, especially in, in rec the recruitment HR space. Um, we've had a number of comments as you were talking and one I just saw that I wanted to come to was, um, you mentioned a website that you uh, had a look at that you found useful. And I wonder if you could uh, perhaps pop that in the chat, please. Um, do you remember the web, you mentioned you, you looked at a website. Um, so if you could just pop that in the chat, that would be really good. Um, so I want to move on now to um, ask uh, Kevin um, about, um, you know, some actions that you might have taken that you'd like to share that you felt were particularly effective. And um, I think you were going to perhaps share a wee bit about organizational and, organizational and cultural change um, and, and how that sort of I guess, evolved in Horsham Royal City Council. Yeah, thanks, Marion. The Just looking back at the action plan in the local stories, uh, it's good to reflect back and look at um, a, a range of things that we've done over the last sort of four years. And uh, it's a bit of a challenge to actually separate things out around what's been, been more important because uh, we've been on this journey starting back with, uh, with Act at Work and uh, the some of the cultural training we did with um, the uh, back, uh, the active bystander training work was done with staff at that particular point. But I think looking back at, and it was interesting the other day, I was looking at the induction manual, council's induction manual uh, with a new staff member and to be able to see the change that's occurred within the organisation around policy uh, within, which is reflected through various aspects uh, through our 
our induction manual, but also the work around uh, the review we've done in our uh, around our community engagement as well. So what we've done is we've basically look at looked at um, uh, applied that gender lens uh, across our whole organisation, and that's informed uh, what we need to do as far as our policies and procedures and so forth. But also the cultural uh, change. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, early on we would have seen some um, some overt sort of um, discuss or comments made, um, inappropriate comments made within the workforce. But I think from my perspective and not that I'm involved in every conversation across the workforce, I certainly have seen a, a, um, a far more sort of um, respectful uh, and considerate um, workforce overall. And that's been supported by our policies and procedures and our, our values we've developed, organisational values, which support the core values across the organisation as in the way we, we, we work together and so forth. Uh, the other aspect has been we've looked at our various uh, uh, mechanisms in, in relation to how we engage with our community, our various committees and so forth, which is constantly evolving, but uh, ensuring um, participation in decision making, it's quite um, critical and um, overcoming barriers. And um, just, a, just one we've done through COVID, it's a small thing, but um, uh, we, we, we had... Uh, monthly all staff meetings, uh, which uh, basically happened after each council meeting and we'd get about 40 people there at the Civic Centre and uh, going into COVID online, uh, I advocated strongly to have those meetings at nine o'clock because, you know, it's like at the start of the day, everyone's got to run around and do what they need to do to get, uh, meet their needs. And for a lot of staff, it's about getting children to school and so forth. And then missing out on that opportunity actually to participate in some of the, the broader organisational discussions. So a simple thing by, of having um, uh, a nine o'clock start and uh, I think online last week we had over 90 people who attended an online all staff meeting. Uh, as, so it's an example of where just that things like that has allowed, allowed greater participation. So it's really challenging um, our structures and uh, to be able to enable that, um, that equal um, you know, that playing field as far as participation, not only within the organisation, but also uh, within our community engagement, we do more broadly. And uh, and it, it's also that sort of, uh, we talk about unconscious bias, but um, that lack of awareness sometimes around what those blockages look like. And uh, being in leadership roles to make change is really important uh, so that um, we, we enable uh, that, those opportunities. So uh, for me, uh, it's been the, uh, it's, it's actually embedding uh, some of the uh, actions that we've looked at through active work uh, and uh, how that's reflected in our, uh, you know, we've got additional funding for our community engagement work and now we're with the new local government act is workforce planning and, and gender equality is very much uh, part of what that looks like. So you can see that we're maturing over time, our overall approach. So it's, um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been really good to actually bring those things on board and uh, start to see how it's becoming more um, part of culture. I think we, we do need to continue to remind ourselves though that we need to keep the focus, so um, not become complacent. There's a lot more work, work to do, but that, um, uh, it's, that's certainly the, some of the things that we've achieved at Horsham. Mm. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, really great examples. I mean, I think we're very relatable and um, things that we can all sort of um, uh, relate to as, as part of the workforce. Um, I think, you know, uh, something that I hope can extend beyond COVID is, is the fact that I think COVID highlighted that many things that we took as a sort of set in concrete or um, a bit immutable uh, can actually be, uh, you know, tweaked or, or changed. And, and I think, you know, what we're doing now is a prime example of that, the ability to, um, to you know, meet um, in this virtual way. Um, but also just, you know, we, we had to make such massive adjustments and the sky didn't fall in um, and, you know, um, we were able to continue to function. So I think perhaps that learning about change is something that might be able to be um, drawn on and extended beyond COVID. Um, Marina, sorry, let's say like one more thing just with COVID. It was sure. interesting, um, yeah. just around that ability uh, for communities have, have actually, there's been a bit of a circuit breaker around 
participation in communities and it actually the way in which communities come back together and the way they connect will be interesting post-COVID because uh, some of the expectations um, are not there. It could be, you know, weekend sport or the like. So I think that it'd be quite interesting coming out of COVID. It does create opportunities to actually reset some of our cultural connections that we've carried on um, pre-COVID and actually uh, to reflect upon those. And um, I think the community will be thinking, discerning about whether whether some of those ways will be the best ways to connect moving forward coming out of COVID. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm a wee bit conscious of time and I do want to um, have a, a bit more of a chat with Jenny uh, now in regards to uh, a particular piece that you've been undertaking at BHS, uh, which is, I think, of, of interest and something um, a bit sort of different, perhaps, uh, around image auditing. Um, that that has been pretty effective. Would you like to talk a bit more about that, Jenny? Yeah, I will. It, it, um, there's so much we could talk about, particularly around the COVID pivoting. But um, pre-COVID, we um, worked with Women's Health Grampians Equality Advocate, Michelle Dunn, who's a photographer, to audit all of our communications channels and our use of photography. So I mentioned um, in terms of staff, we're 78% female, but we also come from 84 countries um, for our four and a half thousand staff. So we wanted to have a look to see if how we're displaying our staff, but also our service users um, was accurate and realistic. And so Michelle had a big hard drive of all of our photos. She looked at our website our staff newsletter, uh, social media and all of our different communications channels and then made some suggestions. So whilst she said that um, there was an effort to show diversity and that's across um, gender, um, nationality, as well as making sure that we're covering off LGBTQI um, populations and representing them, she did find that when we were um, displaying more variety or more diversity. It was generally at events. So our Harmony Day event or our Art of Hobbit events. Um, and it was just looking at ways that we could um, change how we're representing just the everyday um, accessing of health services visuals that we did. So that was really enlightening, I think, for our comms team. And uh, we've changed our practices to be more opportunistic whenever we're out with a camera for whatever it might be, to really consider who's in that shot. Have we got, um, uh, you know, a, a really a good range or a good representation of the diversity that's in the room rather than necessarily just grabbing whoever you see and it might be reinforcing um, stereotypes. So it's, it's that old adage of you can only be what you can see as well. So an example of that is um, our 16 days social media that we've been doing, storytelling and um, representing different staff. So we've got a male nurse unit manager, we've got a female paediatric doctor, um, we've got our Aboriginal health liaison team. So they're little vignettes um, that, that try to demonstrate um, different people. Now COVID has been a challenge in terms of getting out and about and taking photos of people, but it's been an opportunity because we've been able to create a whole new visual look and feel for our messaging using um, icons and, and graphics. And with that, it's much easier. And we've been really conscious of making sure that those representations are diverse and going into um, any kind of visual storytelling with how do we flip a stereotype because everyone is everything in our community. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm aware that what you're talking about is, is visuals and it would be really good to, to have some visuals, but we, we felt it wasn't really practical for a, a webinar such as this, but I know that people can hop on your Facebook page and um, have a look at some of this work. And indeed, I think it's, it's a whole area that we might uh, look to do some follow up on because I think it's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and again, one of those very doable things, you know, mm. that it, you can actually implement a change with quite easily or relatively easily. Um, so look, we are getting quite a few uh, comments and, uh, and questions popping up here in the chat. Um, I might uh, put one back to you, Norman, uh, which was around um, the, um, you know, your sense of how important it is to get support 
from senior leadership in implementing gender equality initiatives. Would you have a comment around that? Oh, yeah, it's, um, there's no doubt, you know, you need the, um, the buy-in from the um, executive and the senior leadership team. But I'll be quite honest, I, I feel like that, that was here from the start. Like we, um, there was, at the start, there might have been, you know, there was the willingness to do something. But I think as we, as we went along, you know, and um, um, raised the awareness, with raising the awareness, we also raised the bar. And there's really strong commitment. Like when we started with, um, with CORE, um, for memory, I think there were two female staff on the senior leadership team out of 13 or 14. In between, we reached five out of 13, 14. At the moment, we dropped back to four out of um, 14. So, um, you know, there's still a way to go. But, um, you know, when we had five, that was close to on par, being on par um, between female, male, uh, senior leadership team members. And I think that's important. And this, the female staff who um, sort of experienced that themselves, they obviously then um, are adding to the another level of um, uh, or layer of um, what's the word I'm after um, um, you know living it um, you know bringing it to the forefront so when they um, have their team members approaching them that uh, they are aware of what they had to go through potentially and uh, it yeah I, I generally believe there was from the start you know a very strong commitment and people wanted to um, you know, live it and breathe it and, and, um, and do the right thing. And, um, you know, we had flexible work, like most organizations, um, we had already um, flexible work arrangements and working from home in place before COVID hit. And, um, you know, just the COVID situation just exacerbated the whole situation. And like, we got a lot of um, plus and, you know, a lot of good things out of it. And um, we have a lot of uh, committed staff who, who stay with us and, um, enjoy being with the organization because they they get the working environment they need to um, meet their you know personal requirements or commitments you know can be family can be what you know whatever it may be and if i if i'm allowed to say this quickly um last year i ran an activity in-house uh, very low-key it was called um walk in my shoes um in line with a famous depeche mode song for the ones of you who may know it, although it has a different background, I found out later, but anyway, that's beside the point. And so, and this was really about, you know, uh, giving some of the um, staff members who, if I'm allowed to use the word, um, fall into a particular minority group to give an outlay to staff to explain what their challenges are. It, it, was, it started with staff members who identify as members of the LGBTIQ plus uh, community people with a migrant background, people with um, either a disability or being a family member of someone who has a disability. But interesting enough, we had two staff members, two male staff members who took up flexible work arrangements to allow their staff, to allow their wives to be, to, um, uh, to live and fulfill their own career and professional um, uh, aspirations. And it was really, pointed out at that conversation um, that, you know, there were other reasons, but that was one reason. And I felt that although initially I thought this flexible work arrangements was just something benefiting them for their commitment to, you know, spend more time with their kids, but it actually had sort of the side effect, if you like, to allow their, their wives to be respected in their profession, be have access to equality and uh, in the sense of, you know, fulfilling their own professional wishes, if that makes sense. And I, I took quite a bit of um, pride and happiness out of that. That's, that's fantastic. A great example, Norman. Um, thank you. And um, I guess, um, you know, uh, I, there's an, an added, I'm reflecting that there's probably an added benefit for you in all this in that, um, you know, I would imagine retention would be enhanced by creating the, the, the sort of flexibility and family-friendly workplace that uh, you're moving towards. Um, somebody has said in the, in the chat that they now have got that song stuck in their head for the day. <laughs> so, I um, a good yeah. thing and not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, good song. Um, 
So look, um, I wanted to just quickly, and, and I want to acknowledge too that you have put the link to that website in the chat. Um, if people can sc scroll back um, a few questions, you will probably um, be able to find that. And the other thing I just wanted to highlight, uh, Jenny mentioned Michelle Dunn as one of the our uh, equality advocates who um, worked on that piece of um, image image diversity and image auditing. Um, and, and Michelle is available to do that sort of uh, work with other organisations. So perhaps get in touch with us at Women's Health Grampians and we can uh, connect you up to that. Um, I do have a couple more questions that I'm hoping I'll be able to squeeze in in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, one is around, um, so, so the, the whole um, focus, we, a lot of our focus has been around gender equality and gender equity and opportunities for women advancing their careers. And Kevin, I guess I'm, uh, you know, would put to you the question around, well, how does that help to end violence against women? I suppose that's a, one of the basic premises of, of CORE, but um, from your point of view, um, how, would you, how would you sort of see that connection? Mm. So I mean, there's the, the need to provide services on the ground and support services for uh, women impacted by violence and uh, within those agencies. Uh, from a, a broader, um, say a council perspective, we talk about leadership, we talk about um, the uh, challenging the stereotypes within the community. So, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, traditional, uh, often uh, regional rural communities that grow up with sort of institutions which may um, not, not enable women's participation. So, basically, what they're doing is creating structures of inequality around power and decision making. So uh, what we, we're challenging is really about changing that so that um, you know, if, if someone's in a circumstance where they're um, under stress or whatever and uh, they're wanting to, uh, to uphold their authority, uh, they'll go back to, they may go back to some preconceived notions around their, their, um, where they sit in relation to those around them. And in particular, if it's in relation to um, say women in their lives, um, depending on what that background looks like. So, uh, we need to tackle that on a range of fronts. So it's not only the individual and their circumstances and uh, the way they're reacting, it's, um, but also how it's reflected in, in our um, institutions. It's also about creating that, uh, those opportunities across the whole spectrum. So that's where from a, um, from a council perspective, we'd be certainly advocating for resources to continue to support um, uh, what's happening on um, in individual lives and circumstances um, through various agencies. But for us, it's very much about how we, we work and provide leadership at, um, as at that sort of broader level to ensure we, we start changing uh, the culture to um, which in a sense will, will um, lead it to over time uh, changing the statistics around um, what um, violence is um, perpetrated. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that, Kevin. It's um, certainly, yeah, um, very much about challenging those stereotypes. Um, Look, I'm just conscious that we've probably got very little time left. And I did want to uh, go back to Jenny and ask for a very quick comment because you, you touched on that COVID pivoting um, issue earlier. And um, I was gonna put you on the spot and ask you if there was, if there was perhaps one or two things that you've um, experienced that you think would be useful to try to retain, hold on to, um, you know, bear in mind going forward. Yeah, um, so just first of all, I think just practically, I just wanted to mention a few things um, that we've done as core members in terms of family violence. So just practically, we've got manager training, family violence leave and dedicated family violence contact offices now. So if you're an employee experiencing family violence, there's a lot more definitely um, than sort of four or five years ago that structurally is wrapped around that particular staff member. In terms of COVID, I think um, whilst, again, 78% female, we're only 65% female at um, management level. So that's team leaders, supervisors, executives, directors. 
And I think something that COVID has shown is um, that you are able to manage people, even if they are frontline service providers, you're able to manage them in a flexible working from home capacity or a hybrid. Um, so that would be something that I would be encouraging us to consider um, reviewing and keeping. I haven't done the stats on how many of that 65% are part-time, but I know from personal experience, it's difficult um, to be in a leadership position in quite a traditional hierarchical health structure um, and not be available in, in a full-time capacity. So that reviewing of um, what does leadership look like and even going a little bit further and looking at what is um, the, the practice of leadership, the structure of our decision making, we're very, particularly in an um, emergency response, we're very command and control in, in terms of how um, our committee and governance structure is set up, but where we do great innovation is in that um, more, I guess, female approach of collaboration and collective impact um, decision making. And I would love to see how we can um, think about running the organisation from more of that kind of feminist governance perspective, given that 78% um, of our employees are women and want to be involved in the decision making. So how can we involve more people across the organisation in working groups and um, really important strategic um, values, decisions, that sort of thing, so that um, it, it isn't just a, a top-down approach, which which we've definitely moved away from um, over the over the last couple of years. Great points, really well made, Jenny. Um, thank you, and thank you all. Um, it's been a it's been a great discussion. I'm sorry that the uh, the time has has run out on us, but um, I think uh, given us plenty of scope to think about where we might take future conversations and. Um, I, I'd encourage everyone to uh, get on the link and, and check out the guide. And I think that there will be opportunities um, for you if you want to engage with, with Kevin or Norman or Jenny in, in further discussion about any of the initiatives you've talked about that um, you're, you're showing great leadership. And I know that that includes a willingness to share your knowledge and um, you know, experiences to help others on these journeys.